that we'll look at is located roughly halfway down the Add Geometry tab. And if you click on, you will see it expands to reveal a second tool. This tool is called the R Fill, and a more legacy version of that tool is called Cap. Both of them are used to fill areas of a mesh very quickly. Let's look at the R Fill first. So I have this mesh here that we can see and we can see this large gap in the center of it. We have a topology made of quads. So the R fill is the best option. When we roll over this mesh, you can see it seems to flash between different variations of fill type. If I roll over the outer edge, it seems to want to fill everything from the outer edge inwards with a new topology. However, if I move towards the center where the hole is, you can see it gives me a result which I'm actually expecting. And that is that I want it to fill this hole with quads. So if I'm happy with this little preview, I will left click the mouse button and you can see it's created quads to fill that hole. Let's undo that and try the other one. So if by mistake I clicked when it was previewing the whole of the mesh, like so, you can see now I get an error. It has created the topology, but it's created a variation of the topology underneath here. Let's undo and repeat what we've just did. When rolling over, you want to make sure that the gap that you are intending to fill is highlighted in yellow. That will give you the desired result. Once that's highlighted, hit the left mouse button and you can see here that we have the intended result. You'll notice I have a wireframe on here. If I look at the back or underneath this mesh, you'll see there's no wireframe. The reason for this is these are back facing polys. You can change how these are displayed. So if I don't want to see any back facing polys, then I will choose this option under the view menu called back face culling. And if I do that, you'll see that my mesh disappears. It's still there. I'm just looking through the existing polygons. So I'm going to rotate around and you can see the front facing polys. So normally when I'm working, I will always use the view and back face culling. And I'll know which faces are back facing because when I preview the mesh like this, I will not see a wireframe. We'll now move over to the cap tool. Now, as I said before, this tool is a legacy tool, but it works pretty much in the same way that the cap tool will always try to make a try if this option is set here. So you'll notice my little toolbar here. And at the moment it's set to try. So here I will click just to escape the tool. You can see it filled the hole with triangles. Let's undo, go back to the cap tool. This time I will try quad one. And you can see when I roll over the area I need to fill, it will give me this result, escape to drop the tool, which may be a result that you're after. Let's undo, hold down the cap again, and try this time quad two. And as I move around, you can see it's trying to predict where I'm going to place it and, and spinning those central edges to try to make the topology that I require. This looks good to me, so I'm going to hit left mouse. The confusing part about this tool is that we, we have this preview and we have to hit escape to remove that. But there you can see I've got a nice topology filling that hole now. Here I can come in with the split rings tool here and, and now maybe add some more lines in there. So these two tools are very useful for one click solutions to fill holes. The next tool we'll look at is the knife tool. Now this tool is very similar to add and split, only it comes with a few more options as we can see in this tool options dialog box. What I'm going to do is just show you some of the basic operations of this. So I have this piece of geometry here and you'll also notice that I have two poly groups. 
One of my polygroups, the green polygroup, is currently turned off. So if I just enable that, you can see there it is. And again, I'll just turn that off for now. So the, the knife tool is, as I said, very similar to the add and split tool. We can do exactly the same as we did before with the add and split tool. Uh, in order to drop the tool here, we don't escape, we double click to make the cut. The other way this tool works, if I left click and drag the mouse and hold shift, I have a constrained line or preview line that's being generated. If I double click the mouse, then I will get a split going all the way through all the polygons it intersects with. I'll just undo that now. And now I'll bring in my green polygroup. We mentioned polygroups before. And to avoid any confusion with ZBrush type polygroups, a polygroup inside of 3D Coat is layer based. So here I have two polygroups, one red and one green and I can turn on and off the visibility between them. However, these polygroups are not connected. So if I, for example, choose the select tool here and I'll click on the green and double click to select all those polys, I will go over to my free move tool here and now I can move this independently. In other words, these two meshes are not welded together. They are separate meshes. The main difference with ZBrush is the polygroups are connected geometry. In 3D Coat, they are separated by layers. The reason this is important is because you can see here that we have an option on the knife tool cut only within the current poly group. I have my green poly group selected. I'm going to hold shift and drag left mouse click and drag and then double click. You'll see that it's stopped at that poly group here and I'll go back to my red poly group and what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the edges of this polygroup and then I'm going to come down to where it says split edge. Now you'll notice that once I split the polygroup into two, the color variations showed me that this is now two polygroups. However, this is where it could get confusing because I'm still on the same layer. These are separate meshes. So if I double click here and I'll hit my free move tool again, you'll notice that now I can pull away that split mesh. So it's considered a separate polygroup in terms of its color. However, let's have a look now and I'll drop that tool. And now I'll use the same approach. I'll use my knife tool and I will say cut only within the current polygroup. This time what I'll do is I'll go across and I'll make this diagonal and watch what happens. So by using this, it didn't understand that this was a separate polygroup. And instead, it recombined this mesh together and it tried to make that split where I indicated I wanted that split to be. So 3D Coat's definition of a polygroup is different than other software applications. And it's important if you're coming from one of those programs to understand the difference. Have a look here at the last option on here which is generate multi-shape polygon. And essentially what this does is it gives me an n-gon which I can use to split. So let's just randomly choose one here and I'll choose this vert to start from here. And then I will pull out a n-gon on here and double click. Notice that I'm trying to click when I'm on the actual edge here. You can see that edge highlighting and I'll double click to accept. And that way now I can use this knife tool with a specific Engon shape to cut holes or cut new geometry 
into the existing polygroup. Next, we'll look at the extrusion tools inside of the 3D Coat modeling room. To start with, let's select some polygons to extrude. So I'm going to select these ones in the middle. And the first method of extrusion that we'll look at is a very basic method. And I'll start by selecting the transform tool. Now with the transform tool selected here, you can see that in the dialog box, I have this option at the bottom, commit extrusion. If I use this current selection as it is, and I just use the widget to pull that selected geometry up, you can see it's just pulling all those faces upwards and everything else is stretching with it. Let's undo that. I'll click on this option here now and say commit extrusion. And now I will pull the same polygons up and you can see that we have an extrusion. Click again and move. And you'll see now I have a fresh extrusion from the previous point. I don't have to keep clicking this button. If I hit enter on the keyboard, it will do the same process and I'm able to continue extruding. With the widget still active, I have the ability to scale and rotate and move all the selected faces. So for example, if I want to scale these ones, I can use this scale part of the widget to bring these in, move them with the arrows or rotate using these endpoints here in any particular axis. And once I'm happy with that edit, I can then hit enter on the keyboard and then extrude out from those polygons. Now that's a very basic way to do extrusions. But down here, you can see there's another option called Smart Extrude. So let's take a look at that. You'll notice that I have a different tools options. I have a similar option here for Commit Extrusion, but I also have a drop-down menu of different extrude modes. Additionally, I have a Mode Tool drop-down as well. Let's go to the Free Extrude mode. And you'll notice on the selected polygons now, I have a different type of widget that I can use. If I roll over this outer circle and left click, I automatically extrude and I am free to move the selected extruded faces in any axis that I choose. If I hold down with the left mouse button still pressed, shift, I can then rotate those selected faces. If I hold down the left mouse button and the right mouse button at the same time, I can scale the selected faces. At any point, I can come in and choose some different faces, still with the free active, and then choose to extrude a different selection instead. Every time I click in this circle, I'm going to extrude a fresh set of polygons. With the free mode still active. If I choose the middle circle and left click, you can see I'm able to just move those selected polys in any direction. There is no extrusion, there is only movement of the selected polys. So now if I click on the outside and extrude, and then the inner circle, I will then move the extruded faces in any direction. So the middle circle only moves depending on the extrude mode that is selected here. If I click this small N, I will get an extrusion again, but this time it's based on the, norm, the surface normal. So the direction is based on the normal of the extruded faces. So here, with the free still selected, I'll hold shift and I will rotate and move these faces like so. And now we can see these faces are pointing in a different direction. Now if I click on the N and extrude, I will only extrude in the direction of those faces. 
every time I click that N, I will create a new extrusion. If I change the extrude mode to extrude faces, if I click on the outside circle now and move upwards, you can see I'm constrained. It is no longer in free mode. I am constrained to move these in one direction. If I click on the middle circle and move, you can see again, I am constrained because I am not allowed to move this in any other direction than directly up and down. Similarly with the normals, I can move this one up and down. You'll notice there I, uh, I created a new extrusion. And similarly, if I click on the outer circle, I'll do the same thing, creating a new extrusion. If I choose the move option on the widget and left click and then hold shift, I can now rotate. If I hold down the left mouse button and the right, and I can scale. At this point, if I use the normals, I can extrude again along the normals of those. But in this case, the outer ring will perform the same function as the normals. Here you can see I've extruded these faces out and just rotated those faces on an angle. If I use the Smart Extrude now and choose Normal as the option here, I get the same widget. And here, if I click on the N, then I will extrude along that normal. If I click the Move, which is the middle circle, I will be restricted to that normal, normal. And the same with the outer circle. So looking at the Smart Extrude tool, one of the options that you might have noticed is the Mode tool. Currently we've been looking at the Simple mode. So on this drop down menu, I'm going to use this new feature called multi extrude. And as you can see, I get some extra options for this particular mode. The green wireframe that you can see here is a preview of what 3D code will generate. If you were to press commit extrusion, you'll notice here that we have the segment quantity. So if I, move through this, you can see I can add and reduce segments to this extrusion. We have a length option where I can extrude 100% or zero, which is essentially flat. You can always go into this option and click. And let's say, for example, I want 200. It will extend beyond the range of this slider. Let's set it back to 100 for now. And here we have our type scale. And this little drop down here gives you variant shapes to choose from as a starting point. I'll go back to pyramid here and you'll notice this little icon here, which resembles a graph. So if I click on this, you can see this scaling this graph scale comes up where I can manually change the shapes of these. If I flatten out the curve here, you can see on the preview, I basically get that extruded straight up. If I move these in, then, then I can start to shape these. I can come in here and click an extra point on here and start to bend these options in. So here, because I've only got two segments, I have a very harsh transition from the base to the top. I'll just accept that for now and then go into my segment quantity 
and just increase those to curve and smooth that transition out. At any time I can go back into here and re-edit this shape. So let's leave it at that for now. And moving further down here, you can see that we've got this option here for twist. And twist will enable me to twist the final extrusion amount. Let's leave it at 20 and I'll click on the commit extrusion. So at this point, 3D Code creates that geometry for me and then previews the next selection based on the same parameters. So here I could either repeat to have a twisting form or I can come in and change this around. So maybe I will flatten this one out and curve it over like this one for the next extrusion and commit that one. At any time I can escape the tool and go back for example to a standard extrusion just use the commit extrude as we've seen before and then go straight up hit enter on the keyboard and create another escape the tool and then go back like so so there's multiple ways that we and tools for extrusions that help us to define the shapes that we can generate the next tool we'll look at is the spline tool the spline tool needs a polygon selection prior to using it. So with my polys selected, I'll click on the spline tool and you'll notice two things happen. First, I have a new tools option box appear. And also I have this widget that's been placed here. The widget is slightly different than the normal widget that we associate with a tool. This one has this red line through it and this acts as an axis reference and what I'm going to do now is snap my view to the front view here and I'm going to hold shift and I'm going to just rotate the axis so it's roughly parallel with the top of this mesh. Next what I'm going to do is hold down shift again and drag it a little bit closer to my mesh. So with this done all I need to do now is use one of these rotation handles and rotate the mesh around. So I'm rotating the selected polys around this axis that we can see here. Because I've only got a segment quantity of three, the more I rotate this around, the more coarse that mesh becomes. So I need to increase the segments in order to smooth that out. You'll notice here we have a scale option and this refers to the selected polys. You can see here the polys have this blue outline to them which means they are still selected. So if I use the scale option I can reduce the size of those selected polys. I can move this in a, in a different direction by using this other rotate widget here. Now I can rotate around and you'll see that the mesh follows. The angle of rotation you can see is being logged in this field here. So if I want something very specific I can come into this box and key that specific number in there. With my polygon selected, if I go over to the spline tool again, you may have noticed this option, modify with spline. If I tick this checkbox, the widget disappears and it is replaced by this pink line, which represents a spline. At the moment, the scale in the tool's options is set to 0.81. This is why we have this tapered extrusion. If I set this to one, it will be a straight extrusion directly upwards. Here I've got some options to check. I've already got modify with spline checked. And if I use this small anchor point here 
and you can see when I roll over it, it becomes a larger option to click. I can click and move this. At the moment, I've only got one point in which I can actually manipulate. What I can do now is double click on the spline and you'll notice it placed a new extrusion point. And now I've got a little bit more to work with. If I click the next option here, edit spline tangents, here I can start to move these tangent points and get a very accurate transition from one extrusion to the other. And the same for the end point here, which effectively is rotating those selected polygons. I'll double click on this pink line again, and now I can move one of the extrusions like so. So you're not limited just to change the end point here. You can also edit the points of the extrusion. Here, for example, if I zoom in, you can see I've got a, an issue with this where it needs to be straightened out. This is where the tangent lines become useful. The spline tool is very useful for this finite control over your extrusions. By clicking the new extrude, it will use the selected polygons and then extrude out again. So here, I could change direction and extrude. Alternatively, I can turn those ones off and just left click and drag that new extrusion out. Here you'll notice that we can rotate the spline knots as well. With this one selected, now I'm going to be able to rotate this, but it only rotates, as you can see, around this axis which was the starting point of my extrusion. The scale option at the top just scales the selected polygons. The next tool we'll look at is the insert tool. I'm going to select some polygons here. So I'll snap to the right view. I'll use my marquee tool here with polygons selected and drag to select all those polygons like so. Down here, under the Smart Extrude, you'll see one of the tools in, that's nested inside there called Inset. Once you click on Inset, you'll have this Tools option. And we have a checkbox here for Individual. And if it's not selected, then it will select all the polygons and consider them all a selection um, in terms of how it's going to operate this Inset command. So. With it unchecked, I will just use either this little widget in the middle and left click and drag to insert those new polygons inside. And this does exactly the same function. Once it's once you're happy with that, then you'll just hit OK. Let's drop that selection and select these polygons in the center. Reselect the tool and this time choose individual. In exactly the same way, it's going to use this widget and we can now insert each polygon individually and say, okay. With that done, we can then go into, for example, the Smart Extrude tool and maybe extrude these faces in or out, depending on which way we want to do this and escape and drop the tool. The next tool we'll look at is the surface strip tool. The surface strip tool is located in this bunch of tools here. So if you don't see it immediately, and if you roll over, you'll probably see it in this sub list here, and then you can click on that tool. Surface strip tool comes with its own parameters, as we can see here. I have a polygroup layer here with a head mesh on, which I'm just using as a reference. It's a very basic sh shape. And then I have a layer here called polygroup that I will actually be working on. So to use this tool, you need a brush setting from this selection here. So with my polygroup layer selected and the surface strip tool selected, I'm just going to left click and drag out a spline. And you can see here that it's created this spline for me. So let's go through some of these parameters here that are in the tool tools options. 
you can see here that I have by not checked. And that means that the spline contains these points here. And if I roll over them, this is what 3D coat means by not. And they are these points along the spline that it considers editable. So if I left click on this knot here, you can see I can change the spline and subsequently change this previewed mesh. So I've got the ability here to move these knots around and position this set of potential polygons to where I want them to be. You can see as well here that I have this option, Edit Spline Tangents. And if I check that, like before, we were able to adjust these parameters of this particular knot. You can see here across the top that we have a width setting and it essentially changes the width of the previewed polygons. Whichever setting I choose on here, once I apply the mesh, I will basically get exactly what I have in the preview as real geometry. The simplification here refers to the drawing of this spline and how many points it uses to generate the spline. I normally keep this around about one. The strip direction refers to the spline in relation to the previewed mesh. Currently, the spline occupies the space in the center or the middle of the, that previewed mesh. If we use this drop down, we can change that to the left or the right of the spline. Normally, I keep mine in the center. So if we move further down here, you can see we have our U spans, which is currently set to two. And if we slide and left mouse click and drag, we can increase these or we can just click here incrementally. The next option down here is this U scale graph. And if I check this, I get extra options. I'm going to use this slide in option here to increase and decrease the overall scale of this preview. Now you can see that this one has tapered the end and this is because of this graph here. If I click on the graph, you can see that we have this tapering going on on the graph. If I move this up in the middle, you can see we now have a uniform preview. If I move it further upwards, the end of my spline is going to scale. I can move this one up too, but let's remove that and place it back to where it was. And when I go beyond, it narrows that last polygon. Let's cancel that for now and select the next option down. This one is quite interesting because it gives us profiles. In the drop down, you can see that we have these various names, but it makes more sense if I show you the U-shaped profile. Here you can see it's previewing a different type of mesh. We have much more, we have many more polygons here, but they have a profile shape. The profile is this shape here. If I rotate this round, like so, you can see why it's called the U-shaped profile because our polygons essentially have this U shape here. So these are preset profiles that I can use in relation to my spline. We have an ellipse, a triangle, square, hexagon, and octagon. For all of these, we have parameters that we can use on this particular shape, and we can change these. And we've already seen the angle where we can rotate that profile around our spline. Again, the profile has its own graph. You can see the graph shape of the U shape, and I can come in here and change the parameters of this shape. If I click on the line, now I can change and modify that shape even more. So you're not limited to the actual profile of these shapes at all. These are just a starting point. You can come in and customize these however you like. Let's cancel that one. If we go back here, let's reduce our 
overall size and go to our scale graph. Again, we can use this to modify the endpoints of our surface strip. Let's remove that profile and set this back. If I just deselect this option here, and I'm also going to deselect the by not checkbox here. What happens now when that is unchecked, I now get some more options. So essentially what's happening now is the spline still is the same spline I drew earlier. Only this time, the difference in polygons from the start point and the end point is now determined by these parameters here. So for example, if I increase, you can see I get more polygons between the beginning and end points of my spline. The U spans work in exactly the same way. This can give me a much smoother curve from beginning to end. And at this point, I can go in and use my scale graph and reduce the endpoints of my mesh. Now I'm not limited to this profile as we see it here in terms of the curve. I can come in here and move my curve around and shape it how I like. Once I'm happy with my mesh, then I can hit apply mesh. And now those polygons have been created. If I'm not happy with the position of those polygons on this layer, I can come in here to the free move tool and reposition those where I want them. I could come in with my points to polys tool, right click and edit these as we've been doing previously. You may be wondering about the wireframe and preview options that we have on this within the modeling room. If you go up to this little box here, you can see that we have a number of checkboxes for this. We have one for Ritopo wireframe, show UV, sharp edges, colored UV islands, and smooth view. If I turn off the Ritopo wireframe, you can see now that I just get a shaded model. The, the color refers to this color option here. So we can disable the, the view of the color. I'll keep that on for now. And also we can look at smooth view, which removes the faceted look that you can see here when we've got these low poly objects. So with the smooth view on, now you can see 3D Coat tries to smooth out as best it can that geometry. Whilst the select tool is visible here, if you hold down shift and left click the mouse, you can rotate the light source around this. This isn't a fixed light source. You can do the same here where we can slide this option left and right. This is just so you can possibly get a little bit more of an idea of the shape you're generating without the wireframe look to your mesh. At any time, you can come back and revert the options like so. In the next video, we will create a series of simple objects in the modeling workspace. See you next time.